I have four sons, and my eldest, Ezra, and second youngest, Joseph, have a difficult history that continues to impact our family. When they were in the sixth and fourth grades, respectively, something deeply troubling happened between them that my ex-wife and I were unaware of at the time. It all came to light one day when we were unexpectedly called to Joseph's school. This was highly unusual since Joseph was not the kind of child to get into trouble. When we arrived, we found out that Joseph had been pushed down by another student. This was particularly alarming because Joseph was already in a full arm cast from a previous injury. The incident escalated quickly. Joseph was so upset that he had to be physically restrained from retaliating, and he eventually made himself sick from crying and screaming. It was at that point that the school called us in. During our meeting with the principal, Joseph made a shocking revelation. For the past two years, he had been harmed by Ezra. This was completely unexpected, and it turned our world upside down. We had always believed that Joseph's broken arm was the result of an accidental fall down the stairs, as both boys had claimed at the time. In reality, it was caused by Ezra pushing him. This revelation shattered our trust and forced us to confront the extent of the harm that had been occurring under our noses. Ezra had always shown signs of behavioral issues, but we had no idea things were this severe. Social services were immediately contacted, and we spent hours at the school that evening trying to figure out what to do next. To ensure Joseph's safety, we decided to temporarily place him with his grandparents while we dealt with Ezra's behavior and sought professional guidance. The stress of the situation took a significant toll on our family, and not long after, my marriage fell apart. My ex-wife and I separated, and custody arrangements were made. Ezra stayed with me, while Joseph and his other two brothers went to live with their mother. However, Joseph primarily stayed with his grandparents, as he felt safest there. Ezra's abusive behavior was never directed at his other two brothers, and they have managed to maintain a relationship with him over the years. But Joseph has remained distant and refuses any contact with Ezra, even as they've grown older. Ezra, now twenty, has expressed a strong desire to reconcile with Joseph and take accountability for his actions. However, Joseph, now eighteen, has made it clear that he wants nothing to do with his older brother. Initially, he was somewhat open to discussing the past with me, but over time, any mention of reconciliation has caused him to shut down entirely. He's become increasingly angry about the subject and has even threatened to cut off contact with me if I persist. The rest of the family, including my ex-wife and Joseph's brothers, believe that reconciliation could help heal some of the pain and division that has plagued us since this all began. They support Ezra's efforts to make amends. However, Joseph's grandparents, who have been his primary caregivers for much of his life, fully support his decision to maintain his distance from Ezra. They believe that his emotional well-being should take precedence and have encouraged him to set boundaries. When all of this first came to light, Ezra faced significant consequences for his actions. Critics often suggest that we didn't do enough, but we took immediate steps to hold him accountable. He began intensive behavioral therapy and lost all privileges. His gaming system, collectible cards, and any form of leisure activities were taken away. For the next year, his life revolved around school, household chores, and therapy sessions. We even transferred him to a different school to ensure that Joseph and his other brothers could stay in a familiar environment without further disruptions. Professionals working with Ezra recommended gradually reintroducing privileges as he made progress, emphasizing the importance of rehabilitation rather than punitive measures that could harm his development further. Some have suggested that Ezra should have been entirely removed from the home or even sent away to protect Joseph. However, our options were limited. Law enforcement and social services were involved from the start and approved the arrangement as long as Ezra and Joseph were no longer under the same roof. We were prepared to pursue more drastic measures if necessary, but we ultimately followed the guidance of the professionals involved. Looking back, I question whether my current efforts to encourage reconciliation are truly for the benefit of my sons, or if they stem from my own guilt and desire to mend our fractured family. I understand that Joseph has every right to decide what is best for him, 
and I don't want to force him into a situation that would cause further harm. At the same time as their father, it's difficult to accept that the rift between them might never heal. My hope is that, with time, they might find a way to move forward, even if reconciliation doesn't happen right away. For now, I am left wondering if my attempts to bring them together are doing more harm than good. The situation we face was one of the most painful and complex decisions a parent could make. On one hand, we had Ezra, a deeply troubled child who had caused significant harm, and on the other, we had Joseph, his victim, who needed to feel safe and protected. The choice boiled down to two difficult options, sending Ezra away, not knowing if he would truly receive the help he needed or if he might harm others, or keeping him with us in the hope that we could guide him toward healing and prevent him from ever hurting anyone again. Ultimately, we decided to keep Ezra with us, largely because we believed that with the right support and structure, he could change. At the same time, Joseph's well-being and sense of security were paramount. He was given the choice to either come home and live without any contact with Ezra, or to remain with his grandparents, if that felt safer. When Joseph chose to stay with his grandparents, we fully supported his decision. We knew that his safety and comfort were non-negotiable, and it wasn't our place to try to convince him otherwise. Joseph's choice was his alone to make, and we had no right to take that sense of control away from him. Respecting his boundaries was our top priority, even though it meant the family would remain divided. For those wondering why we didn't pursue family therapy, the reality is that it was never an option. A court order required Joseph and Ezra to remain separated, which meant any form of joint therapy was legally prohibited. This restriction added another layer of difficulty to an already strained family dynamic. Over the past eight years, much of our focus has been on managing Ezra's behavior and ensuring he received the help he needed. Unfortunately, this often left Joseph feeling sidelined, which was something we deeply regret. Recently, I met with Joseph for breakfast, a meeting we had arranged beforehand. During our time together, I apologize sincerely for my previous actions. Specifically, I admitted that I had been wrong in trying to encourage him to forgive Ezra or even engage with him. I told Joseph that moving forward, I would fully support and respect his boundaries without any attempts to influence his decisions. He deserved to feel safe and in control of his relationships. It was during this conversation that Joseph revealed something shocking. Their mother had given Ezra his phone number without Joseph's consent. Shortly after, Ezra left Joseph a voicemail, and when Joseph didn't respond, another brother called him to question why. I was completely unaware of this chain of events. Hearing this was a wake-up call, and I immediately asked Joseph how he wanted me to handle the situation. He asked me to speak to his mother, and I assured him that I would address the issue directly. Following this, I confronted Ezra and made it clear that his actions were unacceptable. I told him in no uncertain terms to delete Joseph's number and explain that any further boundary violations would not be tolerated. Additionally, I scheduled a family meeting without Joseph present to discuss the importance of respecting his boundaries. I also asked Joseph if he wanted to meet with his mother and brothers, excluding Ezra, to voice his concerns, but he declined. His decision was understandable, given the emotional weight of such a conversation. In the meantime, Joseph and I are preparing for upcoming college tours. He seems to be considering uninviting his mother from the trip, and while that's entirely his decision, I will support whatever makes him feel most comfortable. My priority is ensuring that this experience is positive for him, as it marks an important step in his journey toward independence and healing. At the family meeting, I first addressed their mother and explained that she had crossed a serious boundary by sharing Joseph's phone number. Her justification was that she felt the need to strengthen her relationship with Ezra since he was living with me. I told her plainly that while she may have improved her standing with Ezra, she did so at the expense of Joseph's trust. She began to argue that I was overreacting, but I told her she truly believed that she should say it directly to Joseph. She quickly backed down. I was blunt with her because this wasn't the first time she had prioritized one child's needs over another's, 
and it was clear that her actions were causing harm. During this meeting, Ezra and the middle brother also participated via phone. I reiterated that Joseph's boundaries were not up for debate. Ezra expressed sadness about the situation, but ultimately agreed to respect Joseph's wishes. I told him that his sadness was appropriate. What had happened was painful for everyone involved, and it should serve as a reminder of the consequences of his past actions. The middle brother initially became defensive, but eventually understood why these boundaries were necessary. The youngest brother, who was fifteen, seemed blindsided by the conversation. I had assumed he was aware of recent developments, but he was not. I apologized for initially lumping him in with the others, but emphasized that it was important for him to hear these boundaries verbalized. At his age, he's still learning about the complexities of these dynamics, and I wanted to ensure he had a clear understanding moving forward. Later that day, Joseph came over to my house. It was clear he was struggling, though he chose not to talk about it. I respected his need for space, and we spent the time quietly watching sports together. Even in his silence, I could see the weight he was carrying, and my heart ached for him. Reflecting on everything, I'm deeply grateful for the relationship Joseph and I still have. Despite the mistakes I've made, he continues to trust me enough to spend time together and share parts of his life. That's something I will never take for granted. Over the years, I've tried to juggle the needs of four sons, spread across three households, while also managing the emotional toll of a broken marriage. I've worked to provide financial support, therapy, and stability, but I've also made critical mistakes along the way. For two years, I missed what was happening between my boys, and for the past eight years, I've been trying to make amends. There were times when I became so desperate for peace that I convinced myself Joseph, forgiving Ezra, was the only path forward. That was selfish and short-sighted, I realize now that reconciliation can't be forced, and true healing comes from respecting each person's journey. Moving forward, I'm committed to supporting my sons as individuals, helping them build safe and healthy lives in their own ways. Joseph and I are both looking forward to the college tours and the opportunity to bond during this significant time in his life. It will just be the two of us, and I'm hopeful that we can create new, positive memories together.